morning. I hope we got everybody seated. I'm Susan Sprung, Associate National Executive Director and COO of the Producers Guild. <coughs> it's my pleasure to welcome you to Anatomy of a Workflow, Minimizing Costs for Production. First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to our fantastic friends at Panasonic who are in the back of the room. Thank you, Panasonic, for sponsoring this session. Panasonic is an annual sponsor of the PGA, and we are grateful for our relationship with such a great company. Thank you so much for bringing this session together. We're so appreciative. Now, I'd like to introduce the moderator for this session, Digital Features Director at Variety, David Cohn. Please welcome David. Hi, everybody. <coughs> Thanks for coming out today. Um, let me introduce our panel, and then I, I want to ask some questions of you, the audience, to just get a sense of who we're talking to. But uh, here, to my right, is an extremely distinguished group of people who have a, a lot to say about workflows. Jimmy Fusel is Manager of Production Engineering and Studio Technologies for Netflix. Mitch Gross is Cinema Project Manager for Panasonic USA. Michael Levy is VP of Business Development for Chainsaw. Mark Schwartzbard is DP for Love, Master of None, and many other projects. Stephen Wolf is CEO and producer of Sneak Preview Entertainment, and his projects include 500 Days of Summer and Twin Falls, Idaho. So we are going to spend uh, about an hour talking about workflows, and we'll take questions for you for about, from you for about 15 minutes. So please get your questions ready and hold them to the end. Um, I asked Susan on the way over here, who is our audience? And, and <coughs> she said, you know, it's really hard to pin that down. So I thought I'd just ask you briefly some quick questions by show of hands. Um, first of all, how many here, people here regard yourselves as experts on workflow? Hardly <laughs> anyone, but some. How many people here are not entirely sure what we even mean by that word? <laughs> A few. So most of you are in between. Okay, that's good. How many people here have ever shot on film? Oh, interesting. How many people here uh, have only used file-based workflows? Only a few. How many people here have never used a rotary phone? <laughs> okay. So that's some idea of where we are. Okay. Because uh, I'm old now, so, you know, I, I, I've shot on tape, and, you know, now I feel like a dinosaur having shot on tape. Uh, you know, a few years ago, I was at a Produced by Conference, and I heard a term I had never heard before, and I use it now all the time. And that term was snowflake workflows. And the word snowflake has acquired a different meaning. It, that does not mean workflows that are uh, sensitive to criticism. Uh, it means no two are alike, and uh, that's uh, nowadays at Variety. After covering uh, visual effects and post for 13 years, I now am mostly a video producer and director, <coughs> so I'm dealing with snowflake workflows. So let me go to our panel and ask one question. I'll ask everybody to, to start. We'll start on the far end and work our way this way to answer this question briefly. What's the single biggest mistake you're seeing as producers and production set up their workflows? And why is that mistake such a problem? I would say the first one is not testing the workflow. Um, I think there are, you know, every, every production is, uh, is a group of experienced people who have maybe never worked together for the first time. They all have different ideas of what the best practice is. And... <laughs> Uh, through negotiation, they come to a workflow of some sort and uh, then just say, let's go do that. Um, and then you end up working it out on the first day of shooting, which shakes everybody's confidence. And um, really just at, at that point, you're just playing catch up for the first week and nobody <coughs> really feels good. So I think testing is paramount, I think, when, when you're establishing a workflow. Mitch? I would, uh, I would say it's not taking a far, looking at the forest for the trees sort of uh, mentality, where there's far too often uh, people, they kind of break down into little fiefdoms of, you know, well, here's in production and here's in post-production, and then, and they only think about one part of it at a time. And if you take into consideration the whole 
of your workflow, uh, you know, the, of every step along the way, you can really start prioritizing certain things, but also recognize, well, if I have to end up here, then that can influence where I start there, both to make it easier, but also to make it more effective, and it might cost less money, but it also might, you know, give you a better result along the way and less painful to get from A to Z. Uh, if you think about what Z is in the first place, you might not, you know, you might change your mind about how you want to uh, attack A in order to get there because otherwise uh, you start painting yourself into a corner. Michael? Uh, you stole my thunder a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd say the, the biggest one I see is not considering how production decisions are going to play all the way through the process to the to the very end to the post stages uh, typical example would be you know, desire to shoot GoPro totally valid choice for lots and lots and lots of reasons it turns out that GoPro is a more challenging camera and codec to work with in post which it's all great as long as you know what you're getting into when you make that decision to pick a particular camera pick a particular codec please consider how it's going to play all the way through the process, all the way to the, the end when you now have to work with it in post. Mark? Uh, yeah, mine is uh, not considering a workflow. And I guess speaking mainly of like indie features where it's such a struggle to even get the camera rolling and sometimes you start shooting before you've hired a post supervisor uh, or let alone an editor. Uh, hmm. And then you see things... Uh, the, the direction things tend to go in my experience is then you end up shooting a camera with a bigger file size, a more hefty codec than the project really demands, and that creates cost trickles throughout post. Steven? Well, everybody's pretty much covered it, but I was just going to say, I mean, for me, what's always important on my films is just making sure that everybody who's involved in the technical part of the process, similar to what you were saying about testing, um, is involved in in the workflow conversation early before things start. Um, you know, I do movies that are kind of all over the map between small indie films and studio films. So when I'm doing a studio film, we have more of a machine that can get everybody organized. When I do a smaller indie film, um, we don't always have everything in place like you were saying. But fortunately, I've been doing it long enough that I, you know, can sort of spearhead. Um, thinking about those decisions ahead of time, but it's really good to have uh, conversations, um, not the day before, but at least a, you know a week to ten days before, with all the departments about you know frame rates and and uh, you know what 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 you're doing as far as your backups and and how you're protecting the uh, the uh, media and all of that and what's going to happen to it, where it's going to go, all of that kind of stuff, and making sure everybody's on the same um, uh, you know page. Let me throw this question out to anybody who wants to answer it. I, I think that one, one of the things that's come up for me in my reporting on this over the years is the extent to which these decisions are creative decisions as well as technical decisions. So what's the best way to make sure that as a producer, when you're making these decisions that are going to have these ripple effects going forward, are going to affect the tools that everybody has to use and how the project gets done, that the creative is considered along with budget and, and, and tech? Well, for one, I think that you have to consider what is this project's priorities. I mean, what you know, if, if you're if you're a, fil a project that wants to be shooting all <coughs> handheld for a certain style and it wants to be available light and such, then uh, you're foolish to work in something that work on a, a pro production that is then going to line itself up for a really big, heavy camera system that is going to have to deliver files in a certain way. It's about using an appropriate tool to get the result that you want. And that flows into, you know, production choices, it flows into post-production choices. If you're gonna, if you wanna work with a post-production facility that uh, might specialize in RAW, as opposed to a post-production facility that might be in a video workflow, that affects choices that you're gonna make in your camera. And you might, you know, you can say, well, one could be just as good as the other, depending on what it is that you actually want to achieve in your product. So the first thing is, you know, talking to your creatives, that should be the most important thing. What is it that you want to try and achieve? What is this look that you're going for or, or style of production? And then that's going to influence steps all along the way. 
this can get so politically fraught, though, because uh, like us camera guys don't want anyone telling us what camera to use. Even you know, we bristle at Netflix's 4K <laughs> demand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. But I'm saying that, you know, you talk to the cameraman and say, you know, and the director and say, you know, well, stylistically, what are you trying to, to what do you want it to do? And then, every, and that gets people, it gets people talking to each other and gets working together. I mean, this idea that um, the other, the, with the politics of it, that, you know, others are the enemy and that, you know, because they're going to try and force this thing because they have a vested interest in it. Well, you know what, that's a load of crap at a certain point. I don't think anyone really is an enemy to anyone else. Everyone wants to work together. We're all in this together. It's, it's as big a town as it is, it's as small a town as it is. And it's really trying to do the best for everyone. And there's usually a solution at hand if y'all talk to each other, right? And we try to make work together. So uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest jobs of, uh, of production is just getting the lines of communication functioning properly so that uh, there's no misunderstanding along the way because boy I've seen so many times where right we, you're in you're doing a pre-production plan and then suddenly everything's tossed out the window because someone else had a conversation that you weren't included in and made some big decision that oh well it's going to have this you know for a deliverable as a and, and that means this for your workflow and then that just thrust upon the creative team in a very negative way and you know it's you just want to talk. You just want to be able to communicate. Here's a question I'd love to hear from, from Jimmy and, and from Stephen about. You know, nowadays, you can have a deliverable today. You know your movie's going to go on into theaters, mostly at 2K, maybe some places at 4K, maybe some places in IMAX, and then it's going to go on streaming, and it's going to be all these different definitions on streaming up to and including Ultra HD 4K, and there are new formats coming out all the time that we can't anticipate, although if you, if you, if you hang out in SEMPTI enough, you can get some idea what they are. How do you future-proof your material while still keeping budget under control? How do you, you know, you, we, Mar Mark mentioned this idea that you, you could end up with very large file sizes that aren't appropriate for the project, but they might be appropriate for a deliverable you need down the road. How, how do you balance that? Well, I, I think we, we're kind of known for pushing the 4K agenda, right? And um, mm -hmm. that is part of, of our requirement because of future-proofing future, future -proofing the, the content. Um, and we always try to do it with the creative imperative in mind as well. But I think it means working in a, what, let me put it this way, for nearly a century, we almost accidentally, by shooting film, created a great archive that we could go back to over and over and over again. <coughs> And then we started shooting in video directly to the color space that we were going to display on the television. And then we stepped back and starting to uh, record in log formats again that were that emulated the range of of uh, of film. And but our practices have been slow to shift back towards favoring creating a uh, a master that we can use over and over again. I think uh, that's where. Whereas color science for many years in the film world was about making sure that what you did in the DI room and the, with the colorist was reflected in the theater, I think now a lot of the work that we do with color scientists is more about creating a pipeline that preserves all the range of the photography, of the color correction that was committed so that when there is a new uh, format like HDR or Rec 2020, wider colors, colors that we've never seen before on television, the project can live in that space as well. Um, and sure, I think that right now, it means kind of going back to earlier practices that we had when we were shooting film. Um, and um, it's almost counterintuitive, I think, for some, uh, whether it's in post-production or in production, to think about it that way again, because again, it was so ex accidental for 100 years that we ended up with this great archival format called film. So I'm going to shake that up a little bit <laughs> um, because as a producer, I think the best thing you can do to future proof your work is to create great content, quite honestly. If you create something that people really, really want to see, they'll find a way to adapt it to new, to new, uh, to new uh, um, technologies, really just like what happened with film before. I'm gonna, um, I'd like to add something to that too. And it hits an earlier question. I mean, when, when I talk with producers about uh, honestly, how they should prioritize their budgets. 
I'm with you. I'm, I'm with making decisions first and foremost that are going to show up on the screen. And when, you know, when you're considering whether to shoot 4K or 6K or 8K, but you, you have a limited number of shoot days, I'm, I'm for more shoot days, you know, uh, record in a more efficient Kodak if that's going to help you save some money uh, that you can put on, the, put on the screen. I don't think they're incompatible, though. I well, think there's, there's when, I, when I'm saying actually yeah, compliments yeah, what yeah, you're yeah. saying, quite honestly. Yeah, yeah. I, th I don't think they're incompatible. I think that's what's so interesting about working right now with all the camera development that's happening. I think there are com compressed codecs that are incredibly efficient and look really great. And, um, and that I, I completely agree that the first and foremost part of the workflow should be do no harm. It's like the Hippocratic Oath. It's, you know, you don't want to... Um, put a technical imperative that's going to basically bind um, the, the creatives. Um, but that means taking not only the shorthand view of being able to make your days every day, but also the longhand view of, uh, I think, of, of what opportunities are there going to be uh, to, to let people see this, this, uh, this material for as long as possible. When you say do no harm, what kind of harm can you do exactly? What, on, what are the things that the people in this room should be looking out for when they make those decisions? I think when you create a workflow that's overcomplicated and that puts a lot of responsibility uh, <coughs> on certain areas of the production, uh, whether it's for media backup or a very complex color workflow and pipeline that is very hard to, for other people to understand and all the vendors to connect on. I think these are areas where you're creating risk, basically, of of uh, of people making mistakes, or you know maybe it just takes too long to empty the cards at the end of the day, and you're not sure you're going to get all the cards you need back in the morning. Those are the areas where I'm saying the workflow needs to do no harm. It needs to support the production, not create hurdles for it. Yeah, I mean, I would say that part of it is to not paint yourself into a corner. I mean, people think, oh, I got to shoot raw. You know, if I shoot raw, then it means it's the absolute, you know, unaffected by anything kind of. Well, the fact is that you're going to do something with that footage. You got to be able to see it. You know, otherwise it looks like the Matrix, you know. It, you gotta, it has to look like something. So on set, you need to be able to see what this looks like. What well, means it's turned into a piece of video and then some, a DIT or someone is going to do something, even if just to put a standard like Rec. 7 <coughs> look, anything. It's going to, you're going to be looking at it. So uh, that's fine. That's great. That's important because then you know it's something that the director makes choices on, the DP makes choices on, but that those choices, that information, whether you're shooting in RAW or shooting in a video format, uh, and you know in our Vericams we can shoot in a whole variety of different ways. You can generate proxies and stuff. What you want to do is make sure that that information, that intent, makes its way to post and gets preserved for later work. You know if you somewhere down the line someone wants to make a change but at the same time you you keep the integrity of the original material whether that means you're shooting in raw or you're shooting in a log format uh, you're shooting in uh, 4k 444 or you know whatever it might be you can take that raw data or, or high-end video you know very little compression kind of information and you can take the creative choices that you were trying to make at on the day, at you know, on set, and that information can make it to post cleanly, without <coughs> being, uh, being stamped and, and as they say, baked into the material. Because you still want to have room to, to play with. You need to you know, when you see these two shots together, oh well, that one's a little bit dark compared to this one. You know, it got a, it's a little more green. Whatever. You need to be able to have room to play with it, but also you need to have room to play. You know, ten years from now, when someone wants to repurpose this material. Uh, to now show it on whatever the thing that's going to beam into your brain. Who knows? <laughs> you, you, we don't know what's coming next, but you want to be able to go back to the original, you know, like going back to a camera negative and being able to make the original, you know, creative choices, not only having the material being in this uh, unexpurgated form, but also having a way to keep track of what were the thoughts at the time, the creative thoughts as they were happening. Uh, on set and then in a color correction uh, process, you know, you want to, that's a guide. You want to be able to retain that information. Now we have workflows that are available that, you know, whether it's uh, built into the camera where we can take color systems and 
There are uh, DITs, you know, Colorfront and other systems that can go plug directly into the camera and you can be creating uh, proxies so that you can have a version that's recorded at the same time as your original like master that's in log or in raw. You can also record something that capture, you know, the planned color corrected version and also the what those color correction settings are. All that information can be recorded at the time on, you know, by using the camera or you can have that information in post systems and you can have that go along the way. Whatever it is, you want to be keeping track of that information because that's going to protect not only your creative decisions now, but also your creative decisions in the future. Yeah, actually, and this is really coming into play, and I, I think we all owe Netflix uh, a thank you for emphasizing archiving. You know, that's a, a simple word, but it, it that more probably more than anything else will uh, affect your ability in the future to remaster your material. Uh, we don't have film negative like we used to right. in film separations, but if you've archived your projects kind of every step of the way, uh, you've saved those log dailies. And one thing I thought I'd mention that I'm sure a lot of people understand the difference between uh, raw and log. They're not the same <coughs> thing. And some producers get confused. You can shoot uh, with a log color profile, even if you're not recording raw, you can meaning that you can use a compressed codec, but also but capture with a log profile, which is going to give you that extended range when we get into the color correction step. But what I wanted to mention is so so if you can archive your dailies in a log format, you've got your original material in a way that you can go back to it and do pretty much anything you want to do with it in the future. You want to s archive your offline project, your online project, your color project, and these are things that weren't routinely being done, you know, in earlier times. You had your finished master, but you didn't necessarily have all the information uh, and all of the projects that you used to create that master. And, you know, Netflix has been leading the way in, in, in insisting that all of those pieces be saved, be archived, and I'm in the middle of a remastering project right now for a, a you know, very big, well-known project, and they, they unfortunately didn't have all those incremental uh, things saved, and it's, it's you know, adding ex time and expense. It would have been much easier, and it will be easier <coughs> for the seasons where we do have all that material archived. Now, Mark, you've been a DP for first-time directors, uh, as well as very experienced directors. What are the conversations like when you have to go through with a director and producer your preference for what camera and Kodak to shoot, and what considerations go into that? Uh, first, every time they say they want to shoot film, <laughs> <laughs> and then that conversation ends. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> then the producer gets involved. Uh, uh, typically, I haven't had a lot of directors express enormous uh, opinions on the camera. We try and test cameras and lenses and formats. Our first conversations tend to be more about aspect ratios. If this is our first technical conversation to have, it seems to me. After all the creative conversations and you know what, what are we trying to achieve. Um, uh, you know, the, again, and I don't mean to pick on Netflix about the 4K thing, but that's, <laughs> there's always that conversation. Yeah. Although, you know, to be clear, the, uh, I made the joke about Netflix and 4K. You know, Netflix demanding 4K makes a lot of sense, and Netflix is a big company, and Netflix can afford the 4K, and Netflix works with with production companies that have you know sophisticated mm -hmm. workflows. My concern about uh, the projects that I see using too big a camera are, are again indie features. I, I had a friend who was an editor on a movie, and they he went out with a very low budget movie, uh, art house film. Uh, someone at some point decided to shoot, they should shoot it in uh, anamorphic raw on an airy. Uh, he, you know, they were shooting in the desert. He went out from New York on week two to start editing with his laptop and discover that production was sending a guy out every two days to Best Buy to buy more hard drives. They were completely underwater. And I think the, the, the what had, this ended up costing, I think they had to cut a week or two out of the edit. And I wonder, you know, what did the log, it, looking from the perspective create of adding value to the asset of the movie. I think a couple weeks of the edit may have usurped any Absolutely. archival opportunities. Right. Um, 
I strayed from the question. You're asking. Well, <laughs> well, that's interesting. But to, to drill down on that a little bit, so what did they think they were going to get by shooting the way they were shooting? What were they trying to get? Uh, I worry that they were, uh, you know, someone someone wanted to do the, the best thing. It was a movie they cared about. They just wanted the best. They wanted to go through the camera, just turn up all the knobs to 10 um, without really thinking the whole thing out past that. And that's what will happen. You know, any number of people on set, you know, the DP, the DIT, anyone can rec make recommendations about, you know, well, you know, we got this red camera. It'll do 8K. Shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we do 8K? It doesn't cost us much more. Well, it's going to cost someone a lot more later on, but, but you may be long gone. Or it may cost, again, like the time of the DIT at the end of the day, trying to keep up with the downloads and you have panics about running out of cards and Teamster overtime because the truck is sitting there getting kicked out of the location. Um, all these things come from, you know, it's very, a lot of people are spending time reading stuff on the internet about what's the, the new camera and the best, the best format to go. And you're literally getting down to things like the time it takes to download the cards and the number of drives that you have to buy. These are little details. That's like a it's really real. huge, it's very a real. huge consideration, yeah. I will tell you. I just, I did um, a, Those ex, I mean, sometimes you'll end up with it, with the, uh, did at the end of the day, who's st who has so much to download, he has to stay two, three hours afterwards. That means a lot of other people are staying two, three hours afterwards. And that translates to a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this gets into that forest for the trees kind of uh, question, which is, you know, where you, X amount of money. You know, <coughs> there's X amount of money that's going to get spent on a given production. It's like, you know, you put certain dollars into one area and say, oh, it's going to look so fantastic. It's going to be so wonderful. Uh, you know, just thinking of, you know, that one choice without looking at the trickle down effects uh, is not having a forest for the trees attitude. And you really have to look at, you know, how all these different things influence. I mean, as a camera manufacturer, we try to pre present tools to allow you to work in different ways and then and you can then make the choices that you want to make. So for instance, with, you know, to our horn a little, uh, for instance, when you talk about, you know, got to download those cards, you know, all right, well, we just introduced, because we're trying to listen to the clients, uh, we introduced the, this new, box it, as unsexy as it gets a card reader okay well the xpd3 new card reader it's a thunderbolt 3 so all right that means you're going to have to invest in a in a computer system that's going to be fast enough to deal with it but what also means that you'll be able to download a card from us in seven minutes where it on other systems it might take 40 minutes and that's Time is money, real fast, and so then you can take two of them and then do a daisy chain, and you can do two <coughs> cards in eight minutes. All right, fantastic. That, if you think about what that means for your workflow, if you if you're in a production, you're not only going to shoot so much material each day, and it's not going to make that much of a difference. All right, maybe you don't need it, but if you're in a production where you're going to be, maybe you're multi-camera, or maybe you're just shooting a lot of material because that's the style. Uh, for the production, this could be this one little item of just doing a little research and with you know what it means for your workflow could completely transform your cost structure because it means that your DIT is not going to be there, there working overtime and not going to be uh, having to deal with that timing. You can also you know if you're if you uh, have the camera do uh, do proxies in the camera as opposed to and then output those files as opposed to. Uh, insisting on, all right, well, we're going to get that material from the camera, and then we're going to go into this system here, and we're going to generate our deliverables, you know, for daily work out of this thing. Well, you might have a certain kind of control there, but it also might mean that's spending more time because you're waiting until you get from one stage to the next, and you're going to create essentially a new step that you have to do in order to get this material out. It's fine to be able to get exactly what you need out of it, but it means more time, and time can really be money. So you have to look at you know what what's really important at given stages. If that daily can be created as a you know as a proxy in the camera, <coughs> and then it's just about dumping off files, that could be fine for what you're doing. It's, it shows you everything you might need for a certain kind of kind of production, and then you are saving in a huge amount of time, and you're able to just get something else out of it. Maybe you'll get more production days. Does everybody understand about proxy files when we talk about in-camera To Raise your hands files? if you don't know what that means. What that means with the look table on it? No. Yeah. So that, right, there's a few who don't. So Yeah, so, so when we talk about a proxy file, typically we're <coughs> talking about 
uh, a lower resolution, uh, a smaller file, right? So if measured more in, compressed. in megabits, more compressed. The idea being that if you're doing a master recording at 4K uh, log, uh, some camera systems now have the ability to record a second file, smaller file, in camera simultaneously, uh, typically at 25 or 50 or 100 megabits in HD resolution. And for us in post-production, that, that is tremendously helpful for a project that is shooting a lot of material. That's say, an unscripted project. If you're shooting a, a feature film or you're shooting an episodic TV series where you're only recording you know, maybe f four to five hours a day, it's not as significant. Typically, they're going to go through a traditional dailies processing step to create the deliverables that are going to be used in post-production and to create archive elements. But if you're shooting an unscripted project that you're potentially shooting with more cameras, four or five cameras, shooting tens of hours a day, hundreds of hours for a, um, a project, having those proxy files, those lower resolution, more post-production friendly proxy files is, is a really, really, can be a, a real uh, boon to the budget. It help us both, it speeds up the process of getting into post and we don't have to necessarily manage those larger master files immediately. We can, uh, the next day or when we get back uh, home, we can back them up to LTO, but don't have to necessarily do it the day you're, you're shooting. So it's probably the single biggest factor, I'd say, for saving money on a project that's going to shoot a lot of material is to pick a camera. Either pick a camera that can record an in-camera proxy or spend a little bit of extra money to use an additional outboard recorder that can create that proxy file, that HD, lower resolution, post-friendly proxy file. And, and, um, at the, and at the end of the process, and you eventually go back to the to the master for your, for your yeah, final Yeah, for, for online, the traditional online mastering, we're going to do an up-res going back to that master, you know, the, those master files, but we don't necessarily have to deal with them managing all that data to get you into post and to start editing. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll mention one more thing for, I don't know if there's anybody here who's from the multi-camera world, uh, live event type type production, but that's becoming increasingly helpful and important for that type of work, which uh, our company does a lot of. Uh, if you're doing a, a live music performance or a, a comedy special and you may be shooting with 12 cameras, right, 12 cameras, maybe uh, creating a, a line cut in a truck, you've got you know, many, many, many hours of material. There are now systems that you can use. Again, you're going to spend a bit more money up front in production, but there are systems that you can use in a, a production truck that actually will create the post-production friendly recordings live off the camera in the truck. Uh, a couple of different systems, EVS is one, uh, Prenology, MRES is another, so that we can actually just uh, um, in a short time after the event finishes, uh, we get a type of a hard drive that can take all that material. We have a master resolution media and, and editorial ready AVID uh, DNX media, and all we have to do is copy that media onto our servers and we can begin post, but there's no transcoding no in, involved. Yeah, so just to, you know, again, point out sort of as an on-set or near-set uh, workflow, you can either, in your camera, have, uh, like on, on a Vericam, say 35 or, or LT, you could have a master video recording, and then you could have a sub-recording, and that sub-recording can, like, it can be on a little SD card, and that sub-recording, it would be your proxy, and it's uh, going to be something that you can take into any edit system, and I mean, you can literally take that SD card and stick it into your laptop and just be able to play it live right there, so anyone can use it. But they're going to have matching time code and file names and such. And so, uh, and you can have that proxy uh, have the color correction that you were looking at on set while your master is that uh, log footage so that it has color correction range for later on. So that's one way of working. And another way of working is if you want to be in a RAW, uh, and then we have uh, our uh, Vericam Pure, which has a RAW data recorder on the back of it. And that, uh, the, 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 that uses a codec system, uh, and the way that works is you're going to have to take that raw file off that, you know, in a drive off of the camera anyway and 
copy it, you know, record it and get it into whatever media system you're going to use, that is done on a, on a codex system. And that system will then just output every version that you might want to have. You're going to have your master that file that you're going to have, you know, whatever, however many copies of whatever, but it can also output low res versions, you know, whatever type of uh, deliverable. And when we say deliverable at that stage, it's just deliver, you know, an interim deliverable for an editorial to work with and, you know, something for the studio or whatever client. They have that material, they can look at at any given time, while you still also have that master version. And it all happens at the same time. So as long as you're keeping track of those <coughs> things, you this is where you want to have the communication going from the beginning, because then you know what it takes to get these different outputs for the different stages that you're going to need to work with. Because the last thing you want to do is have to go back to your mastered material, whether it's a high-end video or uh, a raw data, and then generate new stuff off of it for editorial to work with because that's time and expense and it just delays the later work that has to happen in various stages of post, and that's money. I, I'd want to add here, uh, you know, so if we're doing these proxy files, right, you got the camera's doing its main card and say, if it's, a, if it's on the Vericam, you got your 444 log 4K on the big card, you got a separate card in the slot, a little SD card that's recording 1920, 1080 ProRes or something that can go straight to editorial. It does mean you've now got an extra piece of media, right? Now the, the downloader on set, I mean, it's not free, right? The downloader on set now has more stuff to deal with. That's a much smaller card, the proxy file. It's not going to, it's not going to, nearly double <coughs> the amount of time he's going to take. But if I'm doing a job and we don't expect to be using proxy stuff, and the day before someone calls up and says, Post wants you to record a proxy file, so we take the dailies out of Post, I'm going to say I need another guy on set. I need a digital utility because that's going to strap my downloader and he's going to be off the truck. And then we're going to have a big fight about it. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing we need to sort out. The and so that's why you need to talk. But maybe People it's worth need to talk. Talk. I'm just going to. It's a lot cheaper than the dailies. House. I'm going to add also that. Um, even when you're doing scripted stuff, um, there is a tendency now that we're no longer shooting film to just let those cameras roll all the time. So you may be doing a certain amount of, you know, actual photography of, of scripted scenes, but you may have twice as much of, of footage every day from just letting the camera roll and the director's chatting and this is happening or that's happening. So um, super important to take that into the mix because um, you know it's a it's a catch twenty two because every time you cut that camera things fall apart and things slow down um, so the tendency now is to keep the camera rolling because you can just get into the multiple takes faster so something that's a take oftentimes now is seven takes one you know one right after another and sometimes eight minutes of a director chatting in between because because. Uh, um, nobody ever yelled, yelled cut. So um, you, you really have to be prepared for that amount of, of, of media that you're going to have. Um, and that can cost lots of money. But then again, the trade off is that, you know, maybe your production went faster and you made your days because of it. So and you got and you got more um, quality material um, by doing it that way. But there yeah. is a cost of doing it. We that. can mention, so for dailies, typically dailies are budgeted and billed per shot hour. So <laughs> what Steve uh, is talking about, make, you know, goes, you know, translates to dollars. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Let's talk about getting your data, whatever it is, off the set and to wherever it's going next. And this was where we start to get into the next sort of thing that's been so much in the news lately, which is security. The moment it's leaving your camera and leaving your set, now <coughs> it's exposed to the world. How do you keep it from ending up in the hands of people who would like to steal or sell it? You know what, as a practical matter, I, I think that's that's an open question. As, as you know, more and more of us are using um, platform, digital platforms to move media, whether it's a Spera or a Signet or you know, one of these types of systems, I don't know that we're going to be able to say anything definitively today to that you know 100 percent addresses that. I don't know. Maybe so. You, or you just rely on the platform security and, and and hope they've got it together. Well, there are, there are weak spots in in those part of it. I think processes. You know, part part of it is that you you have multiple vendors that are get involved. So I mean, you know, it, it's one thing when you have you know a camera and then a file and then it goes on a hard drive over to 
a post facility and it just travel, you know, once <coughs> you can kind of keep track of it. But the moment you get, you know, here's a sound place and then here's where you're going to do your color correct and then you're going to have deliverables here. I mean, it just starts propagating out and, and you know, and often they're on a network uh, systems to be able to communicate. That's the real danger because there's just so many weak points in all that communication. You know, I, I think the best thing you can do is bring up, you know, bring up that, start that conversation with what whichever vendors you're going to work with because I think uh, it ad addressing it and giving it thought is going to go a long ways towards you know increasing the amount of security but it's 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 challenging also just on a practical level while you're in production get it to your vendor as quickly as possible you know make sure you're sending material over at least twice a day um, and uh, you know don't have it sitting around make a single person responsible for it no, you know, make sure that somebody's checking um, the materials and double checking what's going, and you know how, that your editors are looking at everything and verifying that it's all there. Um, you know, obviously, you you know you have people sign all kinds of legal documents saying that they won't disseminate your material, but you know that's only as good as um, you know someone's someone's trust, really. You know, if there's one thing I could I could say, it's be very conscious of what is connected to the internet. Probably that more than anything else is going to go a long ways towards protecting your data, protecting your dailies. Uh, you know, whenever possible, using systems that are are islands, right? That when you start your editorial process, it's something that uh, we used to get a lot of pushback at it uh, at Chainsaw. We had a, we've had a practice for many years where we don't allow our offline editing systems to be connected directly to the to the internet. Uh, a lot of editors really, really found that inconvenient because it meant that they couldn't download their sound effects and stock footage, uh, couldn't oh, as easily. Sound effects and stock footage. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just, it's easy, you know, or, or check their email, you know. Uh, so that we got a lot of pushback on it. Haven't been getting nearly as much pushback uh, with the news that's come out in the last few weeks about, you know, some of these breaches that have been happening. But so it's a simple thing, but you can do that. You can, you know, both at the offline stage, you know, we're very fortunate we get to work on Game of Thrones at Chainsaw. They are on an island, right? So there's nothing uh, in our workflow that uh, touches Game of Thrones that is connected directly to the to the internet. That's probably the single easiest thing you can do. I'm curious, the horse's mouth. Of yeah, well, I think, the I think. directly involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, well for, us, for, for us, it's, it's really about, you know, not only pushing for best practices on the set, which, you know, I think at this point, most people who work in the industry have, have a good idea of what needs to be done. And really establishing a chain of custody is the most important thing and, and making sure you understand who's responsible for your data. But it's also pushing on manufacturers and on systems, whether it's the hard drive manufacturers to have uh, encryption at, at the hardware level, which again is not super hard necessarily to break, but is a great deterrent. Uh, and also just moving away from, um, from, from a paradigm which is very much a digital negative paradigm. It's, it's the same people handling it as when it was film. And film was inherently protected because very few people had processing uh, labs in their basements, right? So um, whereas you know, now you know, part of the appeal is that working digitally is very easy and the equipment is readily available. So. We've got to change the paradigm, and I don't think, like you said, I don't think we're going to solve that right now, but I think part of what, where we need to be heading is, is no longer dealing with this data necessarily physically as much, uh, and, and really starting to, to put it into a safe place right away, right out of the camera that can be then shared and monitored and logged. And it's very hard to do that in a uh, physical space, but it's much easier to do it, uh, you know, when you're, you're logged all the time when you're using online banking or anything like that. And if we really care about our intellectual property, about the images that we make, <coughs> and making sure that that great twist at the end of the movie doesn't get revealed, we will eventually get to a point where, and I think we can do it fairly soon, where we deal with our images the same way we deal with our personal data. So. Is, it, is it gonna be all, I mean, I know certain, in advertising there are certain companies that insist on yeah, air-gapped security for their computers, you know, in in rooms with thumbprint identification and logging of anyone who gets in and all that. Is that going to be our I think that's still, that to me is still a physical security paradigm 
right? It's still like, you know, going to the bank and having two keys to open your safe and things like that. I think that is part of it, but I think there is another level, which is just the way that you get uh, access. You know, let's say if I could just upload the material directly into a safe system from the set, and then uh, Michael told me that, you know, these people in his editorial department need to have access and I can grant them access to those files, um, then I've really reduced, you know, the, the chain of custody to a few people. And I think that, you know, once connectivity gets greater, once um, we're more comfortable as an industry with working in the same way that the banking industry was working, we have great opportunity there to, to make things safer. But until then, I think uh, everything that everybody said here is, is perfectly right. It's really making sure that the people who are carrying these drives understand that they're carrying 50 people's work, potentially 100 people's work with them. I can tell you the one time I visited Double Negative, the visual effects company in London, they happened to be working on Batman Begins. They couldn't show me anything, which wasn't surprising. It was all on a separate floor with separate key card access mm -hmm. as well as air gapped. So, you know, the, not even the people in the company couldn't get on that floor unless they're working on the project. And as I thought at the time, what's the big deal? Batman, cape, cowl, what are people going to see? But, of course, it's things like the Batmobile and everything else that can be made into toys. So any leak of that would have been potentially very damaging to the film and to, to its ancillary income stream and to its, to its licensed merchandise partners. And I think you're thinking, again, still, that's I was talking about a very physical universe Correct. type of security. I think what we'll eventually get to is, as you were saying, all, the, all your media will go to some virtual space, uh, you know, whether it's a cloud base or whatever, and then there'll be limited access to it. But even with that access, the material itself will remain living in the virtual space. You won't download anything. This is all about computing speed and, and processing and things that we're not to yet. But you'll be able to uh, attach things to it, affect the way it looks or is shaped or is uh, you know, put together, but it will all only exist in that virtual space and you'll just be sort of, uh, you know, talking to it, but you'll never actually ever be able to download that material into a given workspace, and that will afford a lot of protection. That's going to take some time, because right now, uh, the technology is, you just can't work fast enough in order to be able to do that. We have about five minutes before we're going to go to questions from the audience, and there are two big areas that we haven't touched on at all, really, and I'd like to get them in a little bit. One is sound, which hasn't had the same digital revolution as picture. <coughs> so what should people be aware of in sound workflows? David, it was just first. Uh, yeah, yeah, sound came first. You sound had the digital mean, revolution but, but you're still, well before. It's still <laughs> analog <laughs> microphones. You know, you, they still have to go out and make sound, record sound effects. I'll have you know that the sensor on a, every single digital camera is an analog device. <laughs> we, it, that, it is an analog device, and then it goes through an A to D conversion. Uh, that sound actually, uh, because the amount of data that's involved in creating a piece of sound versus creating a, an image, uh, even at a lower resolution, uh, sound is much, much smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it encapsulates fewer frequencies of change. And so sound actually is, you know, the sound editing, sound processing, all that work came, got digital right. well before. Once it's uh, recorded and once, once you have the data. And yeah. that's all this, I, I would say that um, we are in a world, I mean, now you have sound recorders that are built into microphones. You have, uh, you have actual, you know, record, devices that are recorders primarily, and oh, by the way, they have stereoscopic uh, uh, sound, you know, for three-dimensional audio built in, because why not? It's just a little extra part that's stuck on it. So I wouldn't, I'm not actually concerned on that level uh, in that, you know, sound actually leads the way because it's cheaper to. And sound is up to 20K. Yeah. So one guy left. And that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's making me feel old. Okay. So basically, you're talking about basically the same issues in terms of, uh, of uh, managing your data, protecting your data, except the files are smaller, so you will not have a technician on set downloading for hours if you oversample. Yeah, I mean, no, sound. No, that, I mean, that moves much more quickly. Yeah. The, the, the issues that used to cause a lot of uh, trouble related to sound used uh, often sync was something that it's okay. sync, you know, 
metadata wasn't managed correctly, it could cause problems in post if we had to manually sync. It's much harder now to make those mistakes, uh, but it's still possible. Oh, I still so, have once yeah, at least I was gonna once say, so every it's, couple months. It's still possible, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, if you're managing your your you know, your reference data, your time code metadata, fortunately, sound yeah, we don't get yeah. I would say too the, many big, the biggest thing here. to do for sound is always make sure, and it can. It will, it's, as long as the conversation happens beforehand, it won't be a pain in the butt for the cameraman or the sound guy on set, but just make sure in some way, shape, or form that a bit of the work that the sound guy is doing physically somehow makes it onto the data that is recorded on the camera. You know, it's what, it, you know, first they should just have matching time code because if you're not in there, you're, you're about 30 years behind. But it's also that uh, there are ways to get, even if it's just a scratch track, or if it's just a single file thing that just gets over, some way that the camera is recording <coughs> a bit of audio that can be used to That's match out just to keep track of stuff. It saves a world of time in post, and it's ridiculously easy to make happen on set. But there's always a, a problem day one. I mean, I don't know about you, but the last number of jobs I've done, uh, unless we actually get put hire the sound guys for a day to come to the camera prep and do a proper test and send a sync test all the way through the workflow. Every job on day one, there's some kind of, there's some kind of panic that night in dailies where some time code didn't sync up. Or, mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I usually have a little bit of prep time for sound, so so and we have the conversations with everybody you know beforehand whether they're being paid for that prep time or not. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you, you, can't, you can't start to have, there's all of these, these frame rates and all these things are too difficult. It's not like the old days where it was, everything was one way. There's a lot of different ways that things are being done. So you have to have all those conversations before day one. If you start having them on day one, your first few days are going to be bumpy. And, and include sound. Yeah, and it, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Include sound. sound if you're going to do you know, I mean, I'm tests, please, I'm, yeah. I'm working on a movie right now that's well. that's a musical. So that means not only not only our sound people, but all of our music people are included in those conversations. Our music supervisor, the music producer, um, all you know, every single person was involved in those conversations um, early before we got started, so that on day one, you know, we didn't have any bumps. And the boom operator that I was 20 years ago will say one thing: is just I think be mindful of of your sound recordist as well. I think you know, obviously, um, we put a lot of focus into uh, making sure that the shot is correct, but I think there is almost always a way to capture good sound, capture good performance, and that. I don't know. As a producer, maybe you can tell me that uh, matters. You know, I, but. you're not going to like this. <laughs> but but in the end of the day, if, if if there's a movie that plays really well dramatically and some of the pictures less than perfect, the film will still work. If the sound does not work, the film is dead. I agree with this entirely. And I could also say to the boom thing, mm -hmm. like I'm on a show now, a Netflix show, mm -hmm. uh, that shoots uh, you know two cameras all the time, three cameras a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Directors always want to do a wide and a tight, which is the combination that screws the boom guy the most. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, last season, the directors, uh, you know, they it just kind of became you just run the wires. We just we want to shoot it like that. Mm -hmm. Forget the boom. Let's do it on wires. This year, Post has uh, said they they want the boom sound. They're willing to pay to paint out booms on the lock offs. Mm -hmm. So we will we will have that wide camera, even if it's a handheld thing. We'll make that a lock off. We'll have Post is willing to put in the money to. It's, not, it's actually not even that expensive to take things out anymore, yeah, quite honestly. Roll, roll, roll five, clap the slate, <coughs> walk off the camera, count to three, that's your plate, do it on every take, then the boom dips in. A lot of strategizing if the camera's going to move when the boom pulls out, and you know now that's the new plate, and put right. it back in. From a post, post point of view, we actually like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and let's talk about picture editing. Because now that, you know, we've, you've got multiple flavors of Avid, you've got Final Cut Pro, you've got Adobe Premiere. Uh, how do you choose and who should choose? I think it's really important for the editor to be involved. I mean, or, you know. The, the editors always say so, but they also well, also complain that they aren't always. Yeah, but if you're, if you're hiring an editor and they're really only comfortable cutting on one thing, then you have to know that if you're going to impose something else, there may be problems, you know, they may not just not be as, you know, most editors now are able to jump between a lot of different systems. I mean, it's not like it, it used to be. Um, you know, I mean, when I first started, you know, 
editing on those systems the editors didn't even know how to run them you had to have you had to have an assistant who actually did all the cutting and the editor just told them what to do but now everybody's pretty you know proficient in most of them so um you know cost is sometimes a factor if you're doing something smaller budget um uh it can be less expensive to work on premiere than uh than uh, on an avid um i would for a lot for a while i was cutting a lot of features on final cut they seem to have fallen by the wayside for technically and more people for the smaller budget movies are embracing uh um uh premiere so um some of it's just cost really you know the only thing i will say is uh i agree with steve that you know final, final cuts days seem <coughs> to be behind us unless Apple decides to really start pushing Final Cut 10. Uh, it's, it, the world now is pretty much an avid in a Adobe Premiere world. Uh, short form pro projects uh, is where Premiere is really making uh, big inroads. You know, a lot of commercial, promo, uh, corporate, you know, web oriented projects uh, seem to be migrating to Premiere, which is fine. Uh, it has a lot of strengths. Uh, the fact that Adobe uh, has a whole creative suite of products is you know is very appealing to a lot of creative people that the editor can make use of those additional tools uh, you know very easily so that that's all great the the one thing I would caution is if you're uh, interested in premiere is that you really talk through your whole whole workflow and consider if you're going to be staying in, <coughs> that, in that ecosystem that Adobe ecosystem is where Premiere is most successful if you're going to be using uh, post-production vendors, you know, a sound house, a post-finishing house. You just want to make certain that uh, that everything is going to work smoothly when you need to interface with those you know, third-party vendors. Uh, Premiere is you know a work in progress. It's not as easy to move projects from between platforms, between facilities, still, uh, you know, Avid still is. A but I'm just going to throw out. I just did a, a, a premiere feature last year. We had zero problem. That's great. So yeah. that tells me that you were working with vendors yeah. that uh, that were ready for it. At, at Variety, we are on Adobe Premiere because we use Adobe tools for the actual publishing of the magazine. And I got to say, we have, we've talked about moving to Avid, and the, our in-house editor smiles. He says, "Well." Avid editors get paid more money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing that is also important to, to recognize is that, you know, when you make your camera choice, you know, with, with their director and DP, that the, what, what the medium is that you're going to be shooting on, it's not necessarily going to be the medium that you're going to be posting on. And they're going to, and there's going to be a little crosstalk. And so... That's not a bad thing. It's just recognizing that, you know, I mean, there are cameras that say, like, you know, we can record in ProRes, and then you could take that into Final Cut, and you could edit directly or natively in Premiere or other systems. But the, generally, most things, you're going to have a shooting format, and you're going to have an editing format, <coughs> and you're also going to have a deliverable. And there's just some steps involved. And so you want to make sure that with all of that, truly, that is the workflow, you know, moving files, uh, that... They're going to talk to each other in a way that's not going to be painful because suddenly you can have this transcode moment where like, oh, well, guess what? We're going to lose two days because all of this material has to be transcoded so that it can work in this system. So we can't actually do this until we get this material over in a format that we're going to be able to work with. Well, if you haven't planned for that one, it really sucks. We are a time. I'm sorry. Are we, it's time for our Q&A from the audience. Uh, there are microphones. Are there not? So I'm going to call on people, and uh, please wait for the microphone to ask your question in the middle there. Yes. Hello, I'm Baha'i Nozir with Sharp Focus. My question is for Mitch. You talked about the importance of seeing the whole of the flow and seeing the forest. Are you able to see the bottleneck of the entire flow? Usually have multiple workflows too that are dependent of each other. Can you see the big bottleneck? <coughs> when you look at the big picture? Usually you can because, you, you know, you're going to, at each step, you're going to say, all right, I mean, look, you, you guys plan a budget, you plan a schedule, and you're going to say, I need, you know, you have a client like a Netflix that says, well, we need these deliverables. We need th these kind of formats. And 
here are our approved cameras to work with. And then, you know, somewhere inside that you've got to work. And then you start talking to your creatives and they're saying, all right, well, the style that we want to work means that we want to be able to shoot this way. And it's going to mean that we're going to generate X amount of material or, or you know, we want to be able to uh, uh, work in raw or, you know, we want to work uh, uh, with zooms all the all the time, and so therefore we're going to need a certain light level to work with, or something, or and, you know we're going to have X amount of trucks and equipment, you know, and so time on set is going to mean whatever. There's lots of steps along the way, and you can just start looking at where uh, what what each of those steps cost, and so that as you hit the different things in production and post, you say, all right, well, what you know, what how does one affect the other? Because if the post house says we have to, you know, in order to deliver this thing you want, if you would want to use that camera, it means that we need X amount of time to be able to take that material and put it in the system that we're going to work with in order to deliver that. And you say, all right, well, okay, I know what that means. I can just plan for that. Or I can go back to my creatives and say, all right, I know you guys say you want to do this, but that means I'm limited on budget for this. So if you know they've given a couple options, if you're willing to go with one of these other options, I can buy you two more days of shooting. And this is a conversation that happens back and forth. It's never about imposing one thing on another other than you're gonna have a deliverable to your client and you have to meet that deliverable. You're gonna have a certain amount of dollars that you're gonna have to work with, that's your limit. And then you just find what's best inside there. There's no one answer to it, that's the thing, because every job is a little <coughs> bit different. You just have to kind of step back and try to t uh, take as many of these things into account beforehand as you can. Next question here, yeah. Hi, on the topic of security, um, I would argue that air gapping no longer exists because of smartphones. Um, we're, bringing, we're bringing very powerful internet connected devices in our back pocket into systems, um, especially, especially at the mid-grade level. Like if you're in a high-end visual effects <coughs> facility, yes, they will have means to block the smartphones, but a lot of editing rooms, et cetera, um, it's a real problem, and when you're air-gapped, you are also blind when you have internet connectivity, you can create endpoint management, device registration, mm -hmm. you can turn on and off USB ports, et cetera, remotely, so that you actually have eyes on where and what is happening to the media. So I would argue that air gapping is not, is already today moving out of the viable means of protection. Um, the other thing I'd like to comment on is when you're choosing facilities, uh, looking into facilities that have certification the MPAA, the CDSA, the studios all vet and check on the security measures at the different facilities. And um, some of the recent leaks were because the facilities hadn't been certified. Yeah. Next question. Uh, if I could Here. just comment on that real quick, I think um, I, I think that's absolutely correct that air gapping is is, is an issue. But I think it, we have to recognize as well that that security is a is, is a people problem as well and we have to that's that's a big measure and that also we have to be careful that the measures that we put in place for uh, increasing security don't make the workflow or the working within the security boundary so laborious that people make mistakes that's been my you know on the facility side working on the facility side that has been my experience that um, very restrictive security measures can sometimes cause more issues because they end up with uh, people making errors and sending a file to the wrong production or something like that. So uh, I just wanted to add to that. Down here. Hi, uh, my name is Richard. I'm an independent uh, director uh, producer of feature films. And uh, I really want to thank Panasonic for sponsoring uh, this event today. But I have a question about other 4K uh, UHD types of cameras. And my question is whether uh, Anybody on the panel here has had problems with like black magic or red or Canon cameras uh, impacting their workflow for a 4K uh, UHD product? And, and can I ask what, when you say problems, what, <coughs> what do you have something in mind? Uh, just the quality of the, oh, the quality.
quality of the images captured and uh, the impact it has on post-production? So you know what, I, 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 like I can't, magic or I, I can't magic. comment on black magic. I'm not sure why, maybe other panelists know why, mm -hmm. that we're not seeing, uh, at least at our facility, hardly any, any people using black magic. But, you know, all the other, uh, sorry, all the other cameras <laughs> that you mentioned, you know, are, are terrific. They, they do a, a great job, create great images. So the answer I would say is no, all the, all the other ones you mentioned uh, we've used very successfully. I think they all have discrete color pipelines and differences, and I think uh, uh, that's where color management uh, in a facility can be very important. I think they, um, uh, you know, I'd like to hear Mark's uh, feedback on that, but I think, you know, some, some cameras emphasize certain areas of the picture, uh, whether it's latitude or resolution or... Um, you know, may have some kind of bias towards a particular component of what they think makes a quality image. Um, and I think that's just important part of testing is, you know, go to your camera house and, and try the different ones and see if you want to end up feeling the best for the particular look of the film. Or maybe it's, and usually I think it's actually the color pipeline that ends up, <coughs> um, you know, skewing you towards a particular choice uh, uh, and, and also maybe the, the ergonomics of the camera itself, right? Questions in the back in the blue shirt. Uh, Mark, do you want to say? Anything? Yeah, yeah. Well, if, uh, if if I real quick on that, that uh, you know, cameras are funny. They're coming out really fast. It's really exhausting trying to keep up with them. And I do think they all just have their own personalities to them. And a lot of camera guys, you know, we we'll go through a round of testing. We'll find one we like. A lot of us tend to stick with that one for a couple of years. Maybe there's a better option on the market at that time it comes out. There, you know until we get exhausted with it and try something else. And uh, it, it's a bit of a learning curve on every camera. Uh, all the, there's a million cameras out there these days that all can do wonderful things. I do tend to think they have their own personalities and predispositions, and our preferences get very personal with that. Uh, at the same time, a lot of those personalities and predispositions may have more to do with what we see on the monitor when we're shooting, which is not necessarily representative of what we could do with the camera if we had more time to massage the images or if we were interested in learning how to massage the images from that camera uh, but maybe that doesn't matter if you know if we see something that we can plug it in and it sings to us that's the thing we want to use so. yeah I mean I would just say that you know there was <clears throat> a few years back there was a m bunch of sort of much ballyhooed up shootout camera shootouts and they would like you know have a set and they would have like you know six seven eight cameras go through and there was this sort of false supposition that was behind these shootouts, which was you can get a great picture out of any of these cameras. And the That's true. and you can, but the false supposition is that it's just as easy to get a great picture out of any of these cameras. And that's the problem because a a director and a cinematographer have an intent of what they want on any given kind of job. And uh, they and you know they're the realities of time, money, and frankly, you know, uh, creative energy. I mean, if you have to work really hard in order to get that camera to the look that you want, then you're expending energy on stuff that you could be better used in another area. I mean, you know, time is money, but it's also just, you know, you've only got so many brain cells going at any given time, and you, if you're really having to concentrate on dealing with the proclivities of one particular system versus another, if it's not the one that's appropriate for the work you're doing, then uh, it, it's hampering you in some way because you're not able to focus on the things that you would prefer to be focusing on. Uh, so, you know, at Panasonic, we try to make, you know, we have several different model cameras, we have lots of different functions in them, and we really try to make it, make the camera systems function uh, in a sort of an open way that a cinematographer can then make choices within to use the things that they care most about. And, you know, our first most greatest priority is the most beautiful image quality, you know, accurate colors and skin tones. And then from there, you know, you can, we have this super high sensitivity, you know, with a dual native ISO. And so you could be a really sensitive camera. Maybe you either need less light uh, levels or you, it means that you can use a zoom lens where you would otherwise have been forced to use a prime lens on a certain kind of shooting condition. Or it, it just might mean that you have a smaller lighting package and are able to move around faster 
or not. Or, you know, you might just you choose to use the tools how you choose to use the tools. But you don't want a system that forces you to work a certain way or have to just deal with the equipment because the equipment should be pretty much invisible. It should re it's a tool. You don't want to have to fight your hammer in order to hit, get a nail driven into wood. We have just the time for the one question in the back there. You've got well, a microphone? This is basically going on top of that is that uh, often, a lot of times within a film you're shooting in different environments and you might need different cameras or you're shooting two or three cameras. Do you think based on is it prohibitive when it comes to post workflow to shoot with different brand cameras or even the same brand camera with a different model or with different Kodaks? Or should you always stick with two exactly same cameras, same Kodaks, straight down the line? No, not at all. I mean, uh, the, the short answer is shoot with whatever you want. <laughs> you know, shoot whatever is going to get you creatively what you want. These days, it's not that difficult to mix uh, codecs, resolutions. You know, you, you want to think it through, as we've been talking about, the, to make sure that when you, you know, choose that mix of cameras, that by all means, you, you talk through that entire workflow. You know, how you're going to get that material into post- is it going to be compliant with the requirements? We haven't really talked about deliverables, you know, end deliverables that much uh, this morning, which is, I think, something we, we probably should have emphasized a bit more, that uh, depending on what distributor or distribution channel you're, you're aiming your project towards, you need to make certain that, that how you're capturing your images is going to be acceptable for that application, and, and some of the distribution channels now have very specific requirements. You know, we can talk about that afterwards if you like. But other than that, no, I'd say uh, uh, it's commonplace uh, for us to be posting projects. It's, I'd say it's unusual. It's more the case that it's the exception when someone is only shot with one camera. I'm going to push back on that one a little bit, if only because, you know, as a camera manufacturer, one of the things that we try to do is have a line of cameras that work together well so that, I mean, there are differences in color space, there are differences in dynamic range and other factors that what it will mean is that you're going to have to dumb down one camera in order to get it to the level that uh, another camera is only able to rise up to. Actually, I mean, or you're going to have to sort of paint in. It's just a scale. Right. right. And, and, the other, right. and the other part is that you're going to, otherwise you're going to have to sort of paint in uh, information that didn't exist in order to create a, a look. You know, if, you, if you're not mixing within a scene, you can get away with a lot more. But there are, you know, tools do matter. And there are points where um, they're not, going to really absolutely match even if you put them in their log space and such log spaces are different on different camera systems now i will also say that again this is part of a creative choice and so there's a, a stage at which you know if you need a camera that can physically get into a certain kind of space or be able to be used in a certain kind of rig or contraption or whatever you need to do what you need to do creatively but it means that there's gonna it's gonna affect you later on and as long as that's, it's worth it, then yeah, it can be totally worth it. But it certainly is easier. You know, if you're multi-camera in a given scene, yeah, it's easier to have them be matching cameras. It's just gonna make everything easier, you know, on set as well as later in post. I think that if you have a color scientist on the post side that you can work with, um, I would say that you can mitigate a lot of these issues, honestly. Um, I think that that's some of the great promise of you know what the academy is working on with Aces, and I think it, working with a camera managed workflow, uh, whether it is Aces or you pick you know what camera space you really want to work in on the DI, and work with Michael's color scientist or whoever at your post house. I think you can mitigate a lot of that. But again, I encourage testing because. There are aspects like sharpness and things like that that I think are very particular. On that note, we are out of time. <laughs> uh, I know you